Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. And we should be live now, just monitoring. And welcome to this uh, second talk of the day. And we have Vladik with us, well-known person from the DDD community. Uh, just as uh, last time, uh, please join us on uh, YouTube. And uh, oh, I see I, my screen is gone. Sorry for that. So here we go. And now you will see the screen. So sorry for that hiccup, always happens at the start. So we're gonna start the video now and go to YouTube where you already are and you can chat with Vladik there and enjoy the video. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I don't know, it depends where you're from. My name is Vladek, and first of all, I wanna thank you for joining my session, microservices, bounded context, and everything in between. As we go along, if you have any questions, please ask them. And by the end of the session, I'm going to pick the most interesting question, and its author is going to get a copy of my book. What is domain-driven design? So please ask your questions and let's get started. And I want to start with this quote. It says, 95% of the words are spent extolling the benefits of modularity and very little, if anything, is said about how to achieve it. And the thing is, I can really relate to these words because about six years ago, when I've been working for a company called Ingenobus, one day we decided to jump on this microservices. Success stories of Netflix, Uber, Amazon, eBay, and other microservices heroes, and we decided to give this hip new architectural style a try. Now, about three months later, we found ourselves in such a huge mess. Now, what happened was we concentrated our efforts on the cool technological things, but we didn't pay due attention to the more fundamental stuff, modularity and how to achieve it, just as this quote says. So we invested in serverless frameworks and modern messaging platforms, but we didn't think over how to properly decompose a system into microservices, like where to draw boundaries between the services and how to decide whether some functionality belongs to one microservice or another one. Instead, we naively approached microservices thinking that the smaller the service, the better. And this way of thinking led us straight into the chains of a distributed monolith. Over the next few years, we tried to right our wrongs. Instead of going for those tiny services, we evaluated different decomposition strategies. And in this presentation, I'm going to share with you what we had learned along the way. This is our agenda for the next 45 or so minutes. I will start by describing those decomposition those tiny services we evaluated in next different we'll see how they apply in the microservices realm. And finally, we'll go over some design heuristics for optimizing microservices-based architectures that we ended up using in our company. But first, since I'm going to use Internovus for all the examples here, I'd like to take a minute and briefly introduce you to the business domain of that company. So, say you're producing a product or a service. Internovus allows you to outsource all your marketing-related chores. You'll get the best marketing strategy for your product. The copywriters and graphic designers will produce tons of creative materials, such as banners and landing pages that will be used to run advertising campaigns to promote your product. All the leads generated by these campaigns are going to be handled by Internovus' own sales agents who will make the calls and hopefully close some sales. And most importantly, this whole process provides many opportunities for optimization. And that's exactly what the analysis department is in charge of. 
They are analyzing all this data to make sure that both Internovus and its clients all are getting the biggest bang for the buck. That's the business domain of Internovus. Now, there is something important I want to note here. That company, Internovus, practically it doesn't exist anymore. Which means I am free to say whatever I want. And with that, let's see the different ways we try to decompose that huge business domain into modular components. And the first strategy is domain-driven designs bounded context. In domain-driven design, the cornerstone practice is cultivating a ubiquitous language. Because to build worthy models, we have to understand the domain expert's way of thinking. And the most effective way to do it is to speak with them, and to speak with them in their own language. What we call, in domain-driven design world, the ubiquitous language. However, domain experts are humans, and humans' behavior can be complex and sometimes unpredictable. So, some of those domain experts may have different mental models for the same business concepts, and others might use the same terms to describe completely different concepts. For example, in Internovus we had campaign managers and sales agents. And for them, the term lead meant different things. For a campaign manager, a lead is a mere event that somebody has shown interest in a product and submitted their contact details. For a sales agent, a lead is a much more complex entity. It has lots of data associated with it, and it has a very rich and complex behavior. So, in such cases of conflicting models, domain-driven design calls for splitting the ubiquitous language and explicitly defining the context in which each smaller language can be applied, its bounded context. And again, in our case, we have leads in two bounded contexts, marketing and sales. Each bounded context defined one and only one model of the lead that is correct in its boundaries. So when we just started, we used these boundaries to decompose our initial monolith. Each bounded context became a separate service. Marketing service and sales service. And that was our first strategy, aligning service boundaries with bounded contexts. However, these services represent pretty wide business areas. You know, as long as there are no inconsistencies in the models, bounded contexts can span multiple business subdomains. For example, in marketing, we had creative catalog for organizing creatives, contracts for managing relations with publishers, and campaign management for running the actual advertising campaigns. And in the sales context, we had CRM, desks, commissions, and other subdomains. And we later used these business subdomains to serve as the physical boundaries of our services. We divided those wide bounded contexts into smaller ones, each representing one business subdomain. So we ended up with services for managing campaigns, creatives, desks, etc. And this approach is actually quite common. In the DDD community, many are calling for having a one-to-one -one relationship between subdomains and bounded contexts. However, when we embarked on that microservices adventure, we strived for even smaller services. So we dug deeper into the business subdomains and extracted their entities and processes into their own microservices. So for example, in our campaign management subdomain, we had business entities such as campaign, funnel, target market, and others. And we used these entities as boundaries for designing services. And that was our third decomposition strategy having each service represent one business entity or process. As I told you in the introduction, initially this approach failed more than miserably for us. However, it did work later in other projects. 
Why did it work later in other projects? We're going to discuss that soon. So to quickly sum it up, these are the three decomposition strategies that we used. We started with an enormous monolithic bounded context. Then we split it into real bounded contexts to protect the consistency of the models. And then we've tried decomposing them into even smaller services, having a service per business subdomain. And we even tried dedicating a service for each business entity. So the question is, which of these three strategies produces those coveted microservices? So let's see, we have three suspects, bounded contexts, business subdomains, and business entities or processes. Let's see whether bounded contexts make good microservices. So I've shown you an example of conflicting models from our company, Lead. Same term that meant totally different things in the marketing and sales context. And to tackle this ambiguity in the model, we split the implementation into two distinct models, each relevant only in its own bounded context. Which means if we cross that boundary, we'll end up with inconsistent models and unexpected behaviors. But are bounded contexts actually the smallest boundaries possible? So let's see. Naturally, bounded contexts can span multiple related subdomains. You can move those subdomains around. You can decompose them further into smaller bounded contexts. And as long as you don't cross the boundary of inconsistent models, According to domain-driven design, all these designs are equally valid bounded contexts. There are no conflicts in them, and each term has only one meaning, and all the models are consistent. Therefore, bounded contexts rather help us to identify boundaries of the biggest valid monolith. And the word valid is the key here. It's not a bad thing. You know, such monolith won't necessarily lead you astray into a big ball of mud. No, it's a viable model that you can work with. But that idea doesn't quite fit the notion of microservices. For microservices, we want smaller boundaries. Another way to put it, each microservice is a bounded context but not each bounded context is a microservice. So for microservices, we have to look elsewhere. And we are left with two options, subdomains and business entities. And to see which one is the better candidate to play the role of a microservice, let's take a step back and define what exactly are those services and microservices. So, first of all, a service is a unit of functionality exposed to the world. Or, a bit more elaborately, according to the team behind SOA, a service is a mechanism to enable access to one or more capabilities where the access is provided using a prescribed interface. And this prescribed interface part is very important. Randy Schaub defines these prescribed interfaces as any mechanism for getting data in or out of a service. It can be synchronous, such as a plain request response model or a bulk ETL operation. It can also be asynchronous operation by producing or consuming events. But overall, synchronous or asynchronous, those are just mechanisms for getting data in or out of a service, its interface. Randy Schaub also calls the interface as the service's front door. And I really, really love this analogy. And that takes us to the definition of a microservice. A microservice is a service with a micro interface. As simple as that. Micro front door. And the reasoning behind this is pretty straightforward. Having less connection points between services reduces coupling between them, 
It limits their reasons for change. It makes it easier to understand each service in particular and to understand the whole system in general. And it also provides better fault isolation and makes the services more autonomous for development, management, and scale. And we also know that microservices should own their databases, right? No other service should be able to access a microservices database directly, but only through its public interface, only through its front door. Why is that? Well, because if a database is exposed outside, it becomes an enormous front door, an enormous public interface. Like how many different SQL queries can you execute on a relational database? Well, I guess infinity is a pretty safe estimate here. But there is a caveat here. You know, having a micro public interface might sound pretty simple, right? Let's just limit those public interfaces to only one public method. Well, you cannot go any further than that. So those will be the perfect microservices. Well, naturally. Let's see what will happen if we do just that. So say we have this backlog service with eight public methods. I want to apply this naive decomposition here. Each service will expose only one public method. But since those are well-behaved microservices, each of them will have its own database and no other service will be allowed to access it. But they do have to work together somehow. They have to synchronize the changes that each service is applying. So for that, they have to expose additional public interfaces, this time for integration purposes. And when visualized, those integrations and data flows look like this mess right here. So paraphrasing Randy Sharp's metaphor, we definitely minimized the front door. But due to the system's requirements, in addition to that front door, we created a huge staff only entrance, the one which is used for integrations with other services. Therefore, the threshold upon which a system can be decomposed into those microservices is defined by the use cases of the whole system. In other words, once we decompose a monolith into modular microservices, the cost of introducing a change goes down. But if you continue decomposing past this threshold, the services interfaces will grow, this time for integration needs. And as a result, the cost of introducing a change will go back up and you will end up with a dreaded distributed monolith. And this is another way to represent this notion visually. You know, if you have everything in one monolithic service, we get a big ball of mud. If we decompose it into proper bounded context, then the average size of a service goes down and it gets even smaller for microservices. But if you keep decomposing further, you will get back to the big ball of mud, a distributed one in this case. So neither subdomains nor business entities can be treated as microservices in all cases. Sometimes a subdomain's boundary can produce micro interface and there are business entities and processes that could be decomposed into microservices without introducing additional coupling. It all depends on the system that you are building. And if we look at the bigger picture, we can see that microservices aren't really about what happens inside of a single service. Microservices are about the interactions and couplings between the system's components its services. To put it another way, what happens inside of a service is local complexity. And what we are dealing with here is global complexity. And here I want to quote Glenford Myers again. 
He says global complexity is the complexity of the overall structure of a program or a system. That is the degree of association or interdependence among the major pieces of a program. Now, it may sound like this quote was taken from some new book on microservices, right? Well, actually, this quote was taken from this book right here, Composite Structured Design. And it doesn't look new, isn't it? Well, actually, this book dates all the way back to 1978. It's more than 40 years old. And instead of microservices, it talks about procedural code. But still, the same design principles apply in our context, building distributed microservices-based systems. And there is nothing surprising here, no. The ideas behind microservices are nothing new. Those are age-old design principles. They were tested out in different paradigms and even in other industries. For example, that's what Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web, says in his Principles of Design article. When you design a system and the features can be broken into loosely bound groups of relatively closely bound features, then that division is a good design. This is just good engineering. So maximizing connections or interactions inside of a service increasing its cohesion and minimizing the connections outside, reducing coupling. That's just good engineering. Therefore, microservices are nothing but services combined with some good engineering practices. In the same post, Tim addresses the fact that components make up systems, and those systems are components themselves in other larger systems and again that's something that we always have to keep in mind while designing microservices also in 1972 barbara published a paper called a design methodology for reliable software systems in which she discusses how to achieve good modularity and she likens good modularity to minimizing the connections between modules so I want to reiterate, a microservice is a service with a micro interface, micro front door. The correct size of that interface is not an absolute value, it's relative. It's defined by the system that the microservice is a part of. And this brings us to good news, bad news. Bad news, there is no easy way to evaluate a system's design. In the past, we had a way to evaluate levels of coupling of procedural code, described in that book that I've just showed you. For objects, Miller Pay Jones introduced the notion of knessence that also provided a way of evaluating the interconnectedness between objects. But we are not there yet for services. Good news, there are design heuristics that can greatly help us to streamline the process of decomposing systems into microservices. I want to show you 10 heuristics that I found most useful back at Intronovus. So first, always decompose to bounded context. If you notice terms that mean different things to different people, define strict bounded context and decompose the system accordingly. Do not implement conflicting models in the same service. Otherwise, there definitely will be balls of mud in your future. Second, do not decompose those bounded contexts further unless you've got a good reason to do so. And that's Martin Fowler's first law of distributed object design. Don't. Because, you know, we can hear left and right about the benefits of microservices but as each distributed system, they do come with a set of challenges and hurdles. Microservices have both pros and cons, just like wider boundaries do, and it's crucial to verify 
whether you are actually dealing with a monolith or not. You know, a monolith is not a type of project or a code base which is longer than X lines of code. No. A monolith is an architecture that undermines business goals, such as delivery of functional or non-functional requirements. If that's not the case, wide service boundaries do have their advantages. They are more flexible and easier to refactor. So before you decompose further, make sure you really need those benefits of microservices. And of course, make sure that you are down with the additional risks and challenges that this architectural approach introduces. Again, if you are one team working on a grateful project, maybe you can stay in the boundaries of a bounded context and decompose further, maybe later, when you will really need it. Now, let's say that you've evaluated the options and came to the conclusion that you do need to decompose further. You do need microservices to support delivery of some functional or non-functional requirements. So, after bounded context, the next level is the level of business subdomains. And domain-driven design is an indispensable tool here. Domain-driven design identifies three types of subdomains, core, supporting, and generic. And this categorization is extremely useful for designing microservices. Generic subdomains are all the stuff that all companies are doing in the same way. For example, in Internovus we had identity and access subdomain, a telephone system, and billing. All these subdomains are complex and boring. So according to DDD, those are already solved problems, and there is no point in investing in your own solution here. It will be cheaper and safer to pick an existing implementation and just use it. And it makes a lot of sense to treat these third-party solutions as separate services and, of course, keep them in their boundaries of their subdomains. In addition, it may be beneficial to abstract its model and implementation details by implementing a thin anti-corruption layer that will be used as a proxy between the consumer and the adopted product. Not only that this ACL exposes a more convenient model to work with, but it also limits the public interface to the actual system's needs, which will make it a well-behaved microservice. The opposite of generic are core subdomains. Here, the company is inventing something new or optimizes some existing practices to gain a competitive advantage. Or, in other words, this is how the company is making money. So, for us, campaign management, the CRM system, and our tailor-made system for calculating sales agents' commissions all were our core subdomains. Inherently, Core subdomains have complex business logic, but contrary to generic subdomains, here we cannot and do not want to use an existing implementation. We want to invent our own solution. But inventing something new is not easy, especially complex business models. Lots of different implementations have to be tried out in order to find the one that maximizes the company's profits. So, in other words, this logic is complex and it's going to change and it's going to change often, especially in the early stages of the project. Therefore, do not rush to decompose them further. Stay in the boundaries of the subdomain. If you do need to decompose further, wait till you gain more domain knowledge and there are less changes in the business logic. The last thing you want is to find yourself making changes across bad boundaries. In such case, the complexity of each change in the code base will be orders of magnitude higher. 
exactly the situation we found ourselves in when we decompose a system into tiny microservices. And finally, supporting subdomains. As generic subdomains, they do not provide any competitive advantage for the company, but they are still needed to support the company's core business. For example, to publish advertising campaigns, we had to manage our creatives and we had to manage our contracts with publishers. To have a CRM system, we had to manage our sales desks around the globe. Now, there is nothing complex or interesting in these subdomains. We didn't have to invent anything novel or smart here. These are simple CRUD interfaces for managing records. Also, contrary to the core subdomains, supporting subdomains change rarely. The business is not really interested in optimizing them or changing them often. They do not provide any additional profits. Therefore, we found it safe to decompose the supporting subdomains further, even at the earlier stages of a project. That's where this approach of having those tiny services, each representing a distinct business entity or process, did work for us for supporting subdomains. So these were the three heuristics related to the different subdomains. Now let's look at decomposition from a different angle. Let's say we have two methods that operate on the same data. We can decide whether they belong to one service or they can be decomposed into two services by evaluating their consistency requirements. If they require concurrency control, which means only one of these methods can be executed in parallel, then both belong to one service and cannot be decomposed. On the other hand, if one service should always read the last write of the second one, then they can be decomposed into two services, but integrated through a synchronous call. Lastly, if they can settle for eventual consistency, then they can be decomposed and integrated asynchronously through events. Now, these are not hard rules. Those are just heuristics for what is possible. There is no point in implementing asynchronous communication if a simple synchronous call can do the job. Okay? And speaking of asynchronous communication, exchanging events is a very common way of integrating microservices. Those events, just like methods, are a part of a service's public interface. So let's see some heuristics for optimizing events schema. Often services can emit quite a few types of events. It's especially true in event-sourced services. But do you really need to expose dozens and even hundreds of different event types? Well, in many cases, the events can be categorized into private events, which are the implementation details of a service, and public events, which are intended to be the service's public interface. Thus, exposing only public events minimizes the service's front door. And another way to minimize event-based public interfaces is to compress them. Let's say you have a service emitting three types of events. Email changed, phone number changed, and address changed. Do you really need to expose such fine-grained events? Well, think about combining them into one contact details changed event. And of course, if you need to, you can keep those smaller events as private implementation details, but project the wider event and expose it as a part of the service's public interface. Another way to minimize the external footprint of the event is to notice that not all events are made equal. Everyone uses the term event nowadays, but if you listen closely, you will notice that there are at least two types of events. When we are speaking about events in the DDD community, we imply domain events, notifications that something interesting has happened in the business domain. For example, new lead received, lead was converted or campaign started. 
But if you listen to people outside of DDD community, for example, Randy Schaub, you will see that by events, he means something else. For him, and I quote, an event is a notification that some state has changed. They're only describing the actual change in a state without any relation to the business context. Now, it might sound limiting, but it makes lots of sense for integration purposes. You can have domain events inside of a service, but expose outside only state changing events, and thus keeping the domain knowledge inside of the service and minimizing its external interface. And if you're exposing events as a service's public interface, you have to make sure that those events are explicit. For example, here is a service emitting the agent assigned to lead events. The meaning of this event is implicit. What does it mean if we receive three such events, one after another? Does it mean that three agents are assigned? Or should the last event override the previous ones? Well, this creates an implicit coupling between the service and its clients. The clients have to make assumptions about the business domain and how it was implemented in the originating service. This design can be improved, for example, by introducing an intermediate event stating that the previous agent was unassigned or have one event type but call it assigned agent changed. Both are much more clear and the clients won't need to make any assumptions and guesses about its meaning. And the last two heuristics are for the after-the-fact scenario. So let's say you have two services and you sense a design smell. Each time one of them changes, the second service has to change as well. And typically that indicates that the services are tightly coupled. Therefore, evaluate those reasons for change, and if you find commonalities, check whether you can loosen the coupling between the services. If not, consider merging them into a single service, because, well, what changes together has to go together. And for the final heuristic, let's go back to the public door metaphor. If a service's public interface is wide and it contains many business-wise unrelated methods, then it can be split apart into smaller services. Also, compare the methods that are used for implementing business requirements and methods implemented for integration purposes. If more methods were added for the sake of integration, it might be a sign of a distributed monolith. Consider re-evaluating the service's boundaries. In such case, the system's design might be simplified greatly by merging some of those coupled services together. So those were the 10 design heuristics that I wanted to share. Let's have a quick recap of what we've seen. First, a service is a unit of functionality exposed to the world through its public interface, its front door. A microservice is a service with a micro interface. The size of the micro interface is not absolute. It depends on the use cases of the overarching system. Our goal here is to reduce the global complexity of the system, the interconnectedness of its components. We've seen that the minimal decomposition level is bounded context. Do not implement conflicting models in the same code base. Always decompose to bounded context. Fowler's first law, you should think twice before decomposing further. Distributed systems have their challenges and hurdles. If you've decided to decompose further, evaluate types of the business subdomains that you are working with. Generic subdomains, the solved problems, should be bought or adopted. Their implementation can reside in a separate service and optionally be proxied by a thin anti-corruption layer. Core subdomains are the competitive advantage of the company. They are complex, risky, and change often. Do not rush decomposing them into tiny services. Instead, stay in the boundaries of the subdomain and decompose further only after you've gained enough knowledge of the business subdomain. Supporting subdomains, on the other hand, 
are simple and change much less frequently. Thus, they can be decomposed further even at the early stages. Evaluating consistency requirements can help us to decide if two methods belong to the same service or can be split across multiple services and how they should communicate with each other. Exposing tons of different event types couples services to their clients. Consider having private events as implementation details, but expose a more restrained set of public events. A way of minimizing the number of outfacing events is to compress data from multiple private events into a wider public event. Also, remember that events come in two flavors, domain events and state change events. Use both types when needed. Make sure that events are self-describing and explicit. Do not make the clients second-guess their meanings. If you have multiple services that change in the same rate, look for ways to reduce coupling between those services. If it can be reduced, consider merging them into one service. And finally, evaluate the services front doors, their public interfaces. If the public interface is too wide, consider decomposing the service into smaller ones. Or, if there are many more integration-related methods, then consider reassessing the boundaries of those services to simplify the design of the overarching system. And I want to finish this presentation by showing you this diagram again. First, because I like it, and second, because it brings us back to the title of this session. I called it microservices, bounded context, and everything in between. So if you do not decompose your system to bounded context, you will get a big ball of mud. If you decompose it past microservices, you will get a distributed big ball of mud. But if you keep your design in this area between bounded context and microservices, then you are in the safe zone. Those are safe designs that you can work with. So microservices, bounded context, and everything in between. Those are safe designs. This is the source code of this presentation. Everything I've shown here was composed from these books, papers, presentations, and of course, from my personal experience. A little shameless plug, check out my book, What is Domain Driven Design? It is available on O'Reilly's online learning platform. Another book I participated in is Domain Driven Design, the first 15 years. You can get it on Limpub. If you want to work with me, check out the open positions we have at Do It International. And if I still didn't bore you to death, please give me another chance. Follow me on Twitter or check out my blog. And with that, thank you so much for your time and for your attention. So, thank you very much. Are you still here, Vladek? I guess not. Uh, thank you all for coming. And um, we can still chat on. Go to Twitter, use the hashtag DDDDDD. And Hope to see you and talk to you on Slack. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Ah, there he is. Well, thank you for that. Normally there's an applause, of course. Well, thank you. <laughs> and hope to see you at the next session, which will be in around 45 minutes. See you then and bye-bye.